Now pray tell me who is going to drink from this water of the fountain of youth? Have you made up your decision yet? Alright, so I've done my research and here's a bunch of papers I've developed supporting all my options regarding a healthy compromise from each party and I don't care! It's me! Mine! Mine! I'm stealing! I'm running! <laughs> Too many years ago, this was the origin of our people. With monarch mother Queen Lizobetti pulling a fast one and scarpering off as fast as her doddery old legs could carry her, I'm surprised anyone could even try to keep up with her at all. Clobbering anyone who even durst get in her way with her royal scarpering scepter, she vamoosed it high tailing off into the safety of the towers inside her castle. And there she sat, skimming away with her ginormous ball of yarn. She perched and she knitted, conniving away as she crafted up the most elaborate cunning bedside quilt to match her equally conniving schemes and plotting supreme. And eventually, there she had it, a conniving of schemes supreme. Calling on her nation's internet gremlins, she got them all together to help craft one of the most largest plots ever. Of course, with their handling and usage of vast and dubious forms of magic, she wasn't going to get herself involved with all that directly, of course, as she didn't want any risks. But the youth of the internet gremlins were already a little bit disposable anyway, and they of course were very much desperate to be coping better than they were now. So when the rich and bountiful blessing was dangled in front of their noses, what could they do but accept and be patriotic, the best they could be, supporting both their queen and their country? And so it happened. Utilising the youth's mass turn to different forms of magic throughout the internet, Queen Lizzo Betty managed to splice her one single glass of immortality water into something far, far, far more powerful and potent. The Queen and her people were now a species infinitely more superior, powerful, better, more advanced. And of course, once you'd all divvied up the potion to portion out to everyone depending on race, class, social standing and whatnot, there was hardly any effects of it left. For people like the monarch mother, of course, it was a noticeable effect. Her being the literal queen and all that, she ended up getting significantly more of it than anyone else. She practically stopped ageing. But everyone had some of it and were of course all cursed by the defining rules and limitations that came with. Only, with the way all the power had been divvied up, that was where the problems began. As the monarchy ma mother sat away in her towers, conniving up plots against the battle-crying foghorn trumpet, who had evidently not stopped yammering since he made off with what was allegedly HIS prime potion. The rest of the people of her kingdom were discovering the true effects of her brew, and how best to utilise it. One example was the homeless. Being literally without any income or social standing at all, they hardly received any powers whatsoever. Granted they got some, but it was never enough to really cause much be beyond perhaps an extra sleight of hand or fast scarpering. The rich frat boys though, you know, we all know the type, living off daddy's money, thinking they're above the law, get away with doing anything and everything. Well, they unfortunately discovered that if you killed a homeless man, you'd end up absorbing his few powers, and oh boy did that kick things off. Bored on their summer breaks, and just not having to work in general, they made a sport of hunting down those who would not be missed. Consuming their powers, feeding their bodies to their hounds, with much controversy surrounding whether people's animals and properties too were bound by the curse of this potion, they hunted and hunted, and through the powers of one homeless man by himself for hardly anything at all, at the rate they were going, the numbers started creeping up. And the queen sat alone in her castle and smiled. People became more brazen. The law was fast taking a step back. With boisterous frat boys on the rampage, high off the taste of bloodlust growing stronger on the daily, any police or law enforcement who dared come in their way soon found themselves swallowed up in the body count. And it seems that by vanquishing those who held less power than you, you could absorb everything from them, no matter who they were. Though, with the decline of a police presence and any enforcement of law, it became soon apparent by several angry gangs of homeless that any frat boys killed by frustration and rage, if they were more powerful than you, you did not get that power. It was spread out equally throughout everyone. And so the monarch mother watched. As her kingdom ravaged itself to pieces before her, her frat boys grew in power and ferocity. 
A dark underbelly turning more and more to the light, becoming more brazen by the day, she hardly even needed to charge him forth at all by the time Foghorn Trumpet finally packed his bags and rampaged his troops over, over to declare war. It was a field day. It was a bloodbath. It was history. After Foghorn Trumpet's demise, it was almost as though the kingdom had turned a new chapter. With everyone being vanquished who could possibly be vanquished, there was basically no one left who could turn on without seriously drastic consequences. Mostly everyone who was of equal terrible power, and the only two options were to either turn out or turn in on themselves. Those who had fallen to the curse's insistent call, turning out was their only option. The bloodlust had become their whole livelihood, so they then went on to rampage the lands beyond their own. For those who stayed inwards, however, this would be where the games began. The frat boys who were particularly mentally strong, who had been able to resist the curse's full consumption, they had now grown up to the point where they wanted to settle down and acquire a wife. Not just any old wife, though. Like the class system and its discrimination, only certain females could prove as a match. And, interestingly enough, it was the more weaker ones. Men didn't want women who was a frat. I guess that never changed. Though the practice of brazenly hunting was no longer in practice, the games were still in place. Women who held much power were either women who were known to kill, or who came from a family line formidable enough to invest considerably into her education or social standing. But on the other hand, you didn't necessarily want someone who was particularly lower class either. For any lower classes that were even still around, Marrying one of them would mean you would be obligated to seek vengeance accordingly on behalf of any family who were killed. And depending on who may have been killing, this could potentially rupture society's whole table of balance as it is. Not to mention that any descendants born from such a union would be a direct balance between the mother's power and the father's. How embarrassing to be of higher caste with descendants who are basically fodder for the system. It was a complicated game, and it wasn't helped by the internet gremlins, now turned societal gremlins who were smart enough to see what's coming. From the day that curse was launched, those who had any power head on their shoulders turned underground to the city's sewers and catacombs. The sort of people who become internet gremlins and dabble in magic such as this were usually interesting people regardless. Not to say that they were of less power, I feel that by passing that stereotype would be incredibly unfair. But if you were an internet gremlin, chances are there was something going on in your life that had driven you to exist in other forms. So they banded together, made a pact, and no one killed anyone, for fear of being ostracised and left for dead on the surface. Not to say they didn't level up, of course, with the wives of these frat boys wanting power, but not wanting to compromise their stats, they had to turn to other measures to get things done. Killing animals and levelling up for alternative means these former internet gremlins soon became the unseen handymen who were who you went to to get all your dirty work done. Anyone who was a frat boy never saw or could sniff these types down, which I suppose made the woman of this world all the more dangerous. You never knew what connections she might have. And through her networking of who even knows these days, their stats were often known to lie. Who am I though? And why can't you see my stats at all? Oh no, I'm not a former internet gremlin. My family happened to be on holiday while the curse was wrecked. We're citizens, yes, but we weren't inside the borders while the potion was divvied out. So, in a sense, we're outside the game completely. That smell, though? What? I don't know what you mean. Definitely can't be attached to me. No, not catacomby at all.